Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. We read the psalm in unison. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? 
And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. It is my joy to welcome this morning uh, Dr. Mary Neal. Dr. Neal lives in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and she is an orthopedic surgeon. And as you will hear, um, she was in a, a kayaking accident and died. And she has come here to share with you her experience of heaven and of talking with Jesus. And we're so blessed to hear her story. Thank you, Dr. Neal. These robes are kind of difficult. <laughs> How about now? Okay. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. And Kate assures me that the beauty of the second service is I can talk as long as I want. <laughs> now, I'm just kidding, sort of. <laughs> but I am, I am Dr. Mary Neal, and I want to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes about hope and faith and trust. Because I believe that if you choose to trust God's promises, that directly impacts how you experience your daily life. And my understanding of these three words, these three concepts, changed in 1999 when indeed I, I died while kayaking in South America. And I was pinned under 8 to 10 feet of water at the base of a waterfall. And I was without oxygen for 30 minutes before CPR was initiated. And I have to tell you that when I regained consciousness, I was in an absolute state of shock. And it wasn't shock based on the fact that I just drowned. And it wasn't because I had multiple, multiple broken bones in my legs. No, I was in an absolute state of shock because I could not believe that I'd been sent back to my body from a place I will call heaven. And I have to tell you that despite the tremendous turbulence of the water over me, underwater it was very calm, very peaceful. And I discovered a couple of things. First of all, where God's love is present, there was no room for fear. And I'm a pragmatist. I knew the likelihood of my surviving was pretty slim. And I made a, a decision to ask that God's will be done. And, and I didn't ask it in a passive way, sort of like, well, gee, I'm going to die, so okay, Lord, uh, give me some help. No, it was a very active choice. God, your will be done, regardless of what that meant. It was the first time in my life I actually gave up control of the outcome. Like so many of you, I said the Lord's Prayer 
I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times in my lifetime. But again, like most of you, I was self-confident, accomplished. When I said the Lord's Prayer, I really meant, Lord, I want your will to be done as long as it's in line with my own will, and of course on my timetable. But when I was underwater, I truly meant your will be done. And the moment I asked that, I was immediately overcome with a very, very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured by Christ that everything was fine. My husband would be fine. My young children would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And I have to tell you, it wasn't just that I thought it was Christ. I knew it was Jesus just as I would know my husband of 30 years if I saw him in the grocery store. It was an absolute knowledge. And believe me, I did not deserve to be held by Christ. And that's one of the first really powerful parts of this experience for me because none of us deserve it. We all talk about not having to earn God's love, but we don't really believe it. We think that we need to earn it, and we don't. I absolutely knew that not only was Christ holding me, but Christ would be holding any person who asked. And I was taken through a life review that had absolutely little to do with judgment and absolutely everything to do with love and compassion and a grace that comes from an absolute understanding. And as we looked at all the really miserable, painful parts of my own life, I was given this incredible opportunity to see those events from a perspective of 25, 30, 35 times removed. And in doing that, I was shown again and again and again the truth in God's promise that beauty does come of all things. And I was able to see the distant ripple effects of all of those events and see how they impacted not just me, but impacted the world and did create beauty. And eventually, Christ sort of released my spirit to the heavens, and I was immediately greeted by a group of somethings, people, spirits, beings. Those words mean different things to different people, and so I'm never really quite sure which word to choose. But they were people who had known me and loved me as long as I have existed. And I knew on an absolute level that they were there sent by God to love me and welcome me and guide me and make me feel known. And they were overjoyed. They were so jubilant that I was there. And I have to tell you, there was this sort of change in time or dimension. I'm not quite sure what the appropriate words are, but I could be with them celebrating and simultaneously look back at the river, and I could see my bloated purple body pulled ashore. I could watch as my friends started CPR, and I did recognize my own body, and I knew that I was dead. And it was remarkable because I had a great life, magnificent life. I had a wonderful husband. I had four little children who I love more than life itself. But despite that, when I looked at my body, I knew that I had absolutely no intention of returning because I had a very overwhelming sensation of being home, of being where I really, really, truly belong, and I might add where we all truly belong. And I never wanted to leave this particular part of the experience, and, and I will tell you that I'm very analytical, and even at this point, 
there was part of my little thought balloon off to the side that was thinking, wow, this is an incredible hallucination. Never knew it would be so good. But the other part of me knew that it wasn't just a hallucination. And these people started guiding me down this pathway. And this pathway was the most beautiful experience I could ever imagine. The thing that absolutely speaks to my soul, moves me to tears, is color. The intensities of colors, the, the intricacies of flowers and the aromas of flowers. That to me speaks beauty. And that is what I experienced. This pathway was not only woven together with fibers of God's love, but exploded with every color of the universe and some that don't exist here. And flowers that were too many to count and these beautiful aromas. And, and I was experiencing them all at once. Again, there was a shift in time so that I could see it and understand the colors and hear the colors. I know that doesn't make sense. <laughs> But that's what it was like. And I absolutely believe that God presents to each one of us at the time of our death the experience that similarly will speak to us, will make us feel loved and welcomed and known. And for other people, it'll be something else. Personally, I think that speaks to the truth of these types of experiences. Because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, if you break your arm, I can pretty much tell you what your experience is going to be. There are some differences in terms of pain, but it's a physiologic process, and I could tell you pretty much the timeline of what's going to happen. But when it comes to these near-death or after-death experiences, we all describe not only this purity of God's love, but we describe intense beauty, inexplicable beauty, indescribable beauty. But the details vary. And they should vary. Because here on earth, we all experience beauty differently. And why would it be different at the end of our life? My husband, for example, is a beautiful musician and is moved by beautiful music. I am tone deaf. <laughs> so if I heard beautiful music, it would not speak to me. Other people will see their animals art, whatever it is that truly moves your soul, I absolutely believe that is what God will present to you. So we kept moving down this pathway toward this great dome structure of sorts that I knew was the point of no return. And as an aside, I will tell you that these people are, again, beings, spirits, I don't know, who were going with me did have a physical form. They had a head and arms and legs and, and they were wearing these robes. They were absolutely brilliant from within, exploding with God's love. And I don't know if that's how we always appear. I only know that in my part of the experience it was a, a physical form, but maybe that's just because that's what I would understand. And every time we got a little bit further down this path, the people who were still at the river kept calling to me to come back and take a breath. Please come back and take a breath. And I could hear them. I could see them. And one fellow was a young man, only 18 at the time, and he was really vulnerable. And I would be on the pathway and look back and I'd say, okay, I'll give you a breath. So I would go back and lie down and take a breath and immediately rejoin these people who were taking me down this pathway. And, and we'd get a little bit further. And I have to tell you that my only desire was to get to this point of no return. It was the most alluring uh, reality I could ever begin to imagine. And, and then this young fellow would start calling to me again to come back and take a breath. And Eventually, I'd be overcome with compassion, and I'd say, okay, just a minute. <laughs> I'll be right back. And I would go back down and take a breath, and this cycle went on and on 15 or 20 times. And it was very interesting to talk to him afterward because 
I was very frustrated that he kept calling me back. And he was very frustrated because I would take a breath, which to me means one, and then I would stop breathing again. Eventually, we did get to the end of this pathway, and I was at this great arched entryway of sorts for what seemed like many hours. And while I was there, I had a complete understanding of the divine order of the universe. Not necessarily an understanding of the divine nature, but the divine order. I absolutely understood and could see how all living creatures are entirely interconnected. I also had an absolute understanding, even though I can't describe it, we don't have the language to describe it, I had an absolute understanding of how it could possibly be true that God knows each and every one of us individually, loves each and every one of us as though we're the only ones, and has a plan for each and every one of our lives and for the world that is one of hope. And for me, that was always a sticking point. I'm a very pragmatic person, and there are billions of us on this planet. We have so much trouble knowing the people in our own neighborhood, let alone loving them. I never could really kind of get my head around that idea that God is a God of all of us. But I can tell you again that it is absolutely true. God knows every one of the billions of us on this planet individually and loves each one of us as though none of you exist <laughs> and has a plan for each one of us and for the world that is one of hope. And again, I kept trying to get over this threshold because I knew that was it. That was the point of no return. And eventually these people told me that it wasn't my time, that I had more work to do on earth, and that I would have to go back to my body. And so I did what <laughs> I think any reasonable person would do, and I said, okay, and now I'm good. I can stay. I had already been reassured by Christ that everything would be fine. So I, I objected, and when I objected, I was given a laundry list of work I still had to do. And I have to tell you, there wasn't a single thing on that list that I was excited about. There wasn't a single thing on that list that I felt qualified to do, that I felt like I had the time to do. Every single thing on the list was something that would challenge me, push me, make me step outside of my comfort zone, because that's the way it is, right? I mean, nobody changes when things are good. When things are good, we, we never want to change. The reality is we change and learn and grow when we're challenged. We can all look back at ourselves from 20 years ago, and we can see all the ways in which we've changed. And usually we've changed in better ways. It's impossible for us to look 20 years in the future and know how we will be different. But intellectually, we all know we will be. And we will be different because of the challenges we have faced. So this laundry list was filled with many challenges, including news of the coming and unexpected death of my oldest son, who at the time was only nine years old. And indeed, 10 years later, he was hit by a car and killed. When I was told specifically about my son's coming death, I asked the question that would be on anyone's lips, which is why? Why my son? And when I asked that, I was immediately reminded of my life review 
in which I had been shown again and again and again the truth of God's promise that beauty comes of all things. And I was reminded that it's a matter of trust. We may not see the beauty that comes out of challenge and heartbreak and heartache, but we can trust that that beauty will eventually emerge, whether we can see it or not. And with that then, I was taken back to my body and reunited there on the side of the river. And I have to tell you, this river was in the middle of nowhere. It was in South America, and it was in southern Chile. And in 1999, at that point in time, there was nothing. There were barely any dirt roads. There was no search and rescue. There was no medical care. We didn't have cell phones or sat phones or any way to communicate. If we had, there was no one to call anyway. And so when I regained consciousness, I of course was in a state of shock because I couldn't believe that I got kicked out. And the people who resuscitated me were in an absolute state of shock because they were thinking, wow. First of all, CPR doesn't usually work. It works 75% of the time on TV and so we think it works. But the reality is, it doesn't usually work. And when you're out in the middle of nowhere, it really doesn't work. And after 30 minutes without oxygen, it never works. And so they were in a state of shock, first of all, because I actually opened my eyes. But they were also in a state of shock because they were thinking, oh, now what? <laughs> we were in the middle of nowhere. There was no way out other than the river. The hillsides were very, very steep and very thickly covered with bamboo. And just as they were trying to figure out what they were going to do next, these two Chilean men just appeared. They didn't have a boat. There's no other way to get there. But they appeared. They never said anything. They just walked over, put my body on top of a boat, and then they, with these friends of mine, just started trying to carry me up the hillside. One of them actually had a machete. And it was a many-hour process. And after a number of hours, we emerged onto this tiny dirt road, as I said, in the middle of nowhere. And exactly there on the road was an ambulance. Now, even today, and I go back to Chile every year, and even today in this part of Chile, I mean, there are not ambulances. And the nearest medical services were four or five hours drive away. And the, the ambulance driver hopped out, and, and these friends of mine described him wearing what a five-year-old would imagine an ambulance driver was supposed to wear. It was just a little off. And he never said a word. He never said, wow, what's happened? I was a mess. I mean, I had both legs were multiply broken. I just drowned. I was on this kayak. I mean, you can imagine this is a, a scene that clearly would tell someone that there's a problem. But this guy never said a word. He never asked what had happened. He just calmly walked over, started putting me in the back of the ambulance. And when one of my friends looked at him and said, what are you doing here? He just very calmly said, waiting. Do I believe he was an angel? Absolutely. Do I believe the young men who appeared on the riverbank were angels? Absolutely. The friends of mine spent the next two days trying to track down the ambulance driver, trying to track down the people, and of course, they didn't exist. And I have to tell you that the subsequent days and weeks were filled with more profound, undeniable miracles. And I had this experience of being neither here nor there. I was sort of moving between the two worlds, one that contained my past and my future, the God of the universe and all that is love, and one that contained my present with the family I cherish and the life I enjoy. 
After a few weeks, things sort of, uh, you know, kind of that veil sort of a pacified. I had a couple of more out-of-body experiences where I believe I was back in heaven. It was the same intensity of God's love, the same intensity of beauty and emotion. I had more conversation with Christ, specifically about this laundry list and about my son's coming death. And then eventually that was over. And I was left with what to make of it. And I have to tell you that at the time, I sort of thought, well, I probably just imagined that. Even though I have absolutely no, no creativity, I thought, well, I, I just, it's a figment of my imagination. Even though I knew I would never be the same again. So I set about trying to figure out what had happened to me. And I spent the many, many weeks and months of my hospitalization and rehabilitation trying to come up with a scientific explanation. So I first read through all my medical records and talked to the people at the river, and then really fueled by this absolute desire to discount everything I'd been told, including what I'd been told about my son's coming death, I read extensively. I read pretty much everything that has ever been written about drowning, about the physiology of a dying brain, about dreams and hallucinations and anoxia and seizures and neurotransmitter dumping. In the end, though, I discovered that all of the conventional explanations fell short. Those medical and scientific gaps were really unbridgeable. And absolutely nothing could explain either my unscathed survival or my profound spiritual experiences. And eventually I realized that I'd had a near-death or after-death experience. And I also discovered that I wasn't alone in that experience. Almost 20 million people in this country alone have had these sorts of profoundly transformative experiences. And the continuation of the soul or consciousness is described in every culture, every faith tradition, and every age group. Even very young children who have never been exposed to religion of any kind recount near-death experiences. Even 75% of avowed atheists have an experience in which they identify a being as Jesus or God. And they're also similar. We all describe this intensity of love and interconnectedness with all living creatures. And regardless of our prior beliefs, God becomes the only truth. Now, you, you can imagine that... <laughs> These experiences are, are profoundly transformative. And the most common question that I am asked is, okay, so what? Great story, but so what? How has my life been transformed? And more importantly, is there something in my experience that can transform the lives of other people? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I find that the most profound transformation for me, and I believe what can be the most profound, profound transformation for any of you, is this transformation from a hope or a faith in the truth of God's promises to an absolute trust. Because when you trust, which is sort of faith in action, when you trust the truth of God's promises, it radically changes who you really are, how you live your life, and why you live your life. And to help you understand this idea, and, and I separate 
faith into those three things because uh, I think it helps um, understand what I'm talking about. And as one example, imagine for a minute that you have spent days walking through the mountains of Nepal and you come across a rickety old hand bridge that crosses a very, very, very deep gorge. Now, let's face it, every one of us is going to look at that and go, oh, I'm terrified. I'm not crossing that. You know, there are slats missing and the whole thing. We've come too far to turn back, but we don't want to go forward. And we can do a couple of different things. We can hope that that bridge is going to hold our weight when we cross it, but that hope is just a wish. It's based on nothing. We can develop a faith that that bridge is going to hold our weight. And we can do that by reading how the bridge was constructed. We can talk to other people who have already crossed over. We can even watch people cross ahead of us. But all of that is external. It isn't until you actually step onto the bridge that you have trust. And that's what I mean when I say that trust is sort of this faith in action. Similarly, if you hope that God's promises are true, that's great. But that's, like, that's no different than saying, well, I hope it rains, or I hope it's sunny, or it's just a wish. It's not based on anything. Many, many people say, well, no, I have faith. I have faith that God's promises are true. But just like the person at the bridge, in our culture at least, and, and I do not mean to discount the faith as described in the Bible, but I think in our culture, the way we typically think about faith or talk about faith is just like the guy at the bridge. It's based on the external. We read what happened in biblical times. We listen to our friends. We listen to the priests. We listen to all kinds of things, but it's all external. And you and I have both had the experience many times of knowing about someone who had a deep faith only to have it shaken or lost when it was challenged. And I contend that that faith was lost or shaken because it was never transformed to trust. And so I believe that trust is the key. And trust is where we should all be moving to. And I absolutely know that trust develops when you see God at work and present in your own life, not in anyone else's life. And I absolutely know that God really is present and active in every person's life, whether you, you believe it or not, whether you even want it to be true or not. It is true, and it is looking back at your own life and finding all the evidence of God's presence that allows you to then step onto that bridge. And so you might say, okay, well, great. What does trust do for me? I will tell you what trust does for me, and I believe this is available to anyone. So as I trust God's promise of forgiveness and of grace, my past is released. I know that God understands me fully. And with that understanding, has nothing but compassion for me, which I believe is grace. And so I can let go of all of my guilt or remorse, or anger with myself. I, I'm released. My past doesn't define me. 
It doesn't dictate who I am, and it certainly doesn't determine what God thinks of me. I'm also able to be free from anger or bitterness or resentment toward other people who have hurt me. Because similarly, I know that if I could understand them and understand what brought them to the point where they hurt me, I would feel nothing but compassion. No different than I know that God has for me. And so I can entirely release my past. doesn't hold me bondage. Similarly, I don't worry about the future. First of all, I know I can assure you that death is nothing but the doorway to home, to our true home, our permanent home, our spiritual home. And so I don't have to be afraid of death because I know that, you know, it's sort of like going on a great trip to Europe. I go to Europe, it's a great adventure. There are some wonderful things, there are things that aren't so good. <laughs> I mean, I said earlier, an adventure is just a disaster that you survive. And, you know, you go to Europe, you go to wherever, and you have this great adventure. And then you come back to Florida, or you come back to wherever your hometown is. And it's the very existence of your home in Florida and the family and the friends who are waiting for you there that allows you to go to Europe and have this magnificent adventure because it brings context and meaning and purpose to your time in Europe. And that's what this permanent home does. The fact that death is a doorway to this home and this home brings context to my life, allows me to experience this life as that great adventure with all of its ups and downs. I'm also not worried about tomorrow. I still plan. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if I could claim to be a type A person anymore, but I'm still a planner for sure. But I absolutely trust that God has a plan for my life that is one of hope. And so I absolutely trust and I know that if my plans for tomorrow do not come to fruition, it's because God has something different and probably a whole lot better in mind for me. And, you know, we can all go, we can prove that to ourselves. You know, we can look back at our past and be so grateful for the things that didn't happen. You know, thank you, Lord, that I didn't get that job that I so desperately wanted because it allowed me to be available for something even greater. Or, you know, I, I say this one all the time, you know, thank God, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that I didn't marry that boy in college who broke my heart because it would have been a disaster and I wouldn't have been available for the man I eventually married. And so, I don't worry about tomorrow, and I'm freed from my past. And what that does is it allows me to be fully present in this moment, on this day. And because I don't have all of this extraneous worry or emotion going on, I am free to constantly be listening for where God would lead me, for what God would have me be doing. I am able to constantly try to reflect God's love to others and to the world because I'm not bogged down by either the past or the future. And that allows me to live in an absolute state of gratitude because even when things are rotten, even when things are miserable, I know that I am being changed, that the world is being changed, and that beauty will eventually emerge from all things. And so it's easy for me to truly be in a state of gratitude, regardless of my circumstances. And most importantly, I am absolutely able to live in a state of joy. 
And I believe God intends for each one of us to live a joy-filled life. And again, that is a joy. Joy is different from happiness, right? Happiness is based on whether things are good or not so good. But joy transcends circumstances. And I will tell you that even on my deepest, darkest days of sorrow after the death of my son, and, and no, my experience does not protect me from grief. Grief is hard. But I will tell you that even on my most grief-filled days, I am absolutely still experiencing great joy because that is the power of this transformation from hope or faith to an absolute trust in God's promises. And that's why I'm here this morning because I want to not just encourage you, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to go home this afternoon and I want you to start doing your own research. Collect your own data. And then I want you to look at your own life. Look back at your life and look for those times that God has led you and loved you and held you and carried you. And I want you to try to prove what I'm saying wrong. Because I know you will not be able to. And I also know that if you do the work of looking back at your own life, if you do the work of seeing God's handprint in your own life, then you also will be able to choose to trust God's promises. And when you make that choice and you step out onto that bridge, your life will be changed in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking up this challenge. And may God bless your journey. And now let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty God, as we move through the fall season, help us to bring you with us into every aspect of our lives. Holy Spirit, come among us. We pray for all who are sick, lonely, grieving, or in pain, especially the dead, the missing, and the displaced in California and Bill Ball. Comfort them with the light of your presence. Holy Spirit, come among us. Watch over this cathedral and this city, that we may serve you and bring new life to downtown Jacksonville. Holy Spirit, come among us. Bring peace to our broken world, that there may be greater understanding among races and people and all of our elected officials. Holy Spirit, come among us. Foster in us the awareness that this earth is yours and help us to care for it with love and devotion. Holy Spirit, come among us. Bless all who have died. We leave them in your loving arms. The Holy Spirit, come among us. Almighty God, we thank you for this powerful witness. And we ask that you would help us to go forward from this place, trusting that you will hold us and bring us home so that this life may be a great adventure of joy and service to you. This we ask in the name of Jesus, your Son, Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Don't you feel as if you've been given a great gift? That's how I feel. 
Let's thank Dr. Neal one more time. You know, she is an introvert, so this is an incredible act of service for her to be here with us. I want to welcome all of you. We have a lot of guests. If you raise your hand, the ushers will bring you a present. And we're so glad you're here, so don't be shy. But you have to hold your hand up high so they can find you, and you have to keep it up until the present arrives, okay? Don't be shy. We won't make you give a speech. But we're just so glad you're here, and we hope you'll come back. So keep those hands up until your gift comes. Welcome, welcome. We're looking for nominations for vestry and delegates to the diocesan convention, and you can read more about that in the announcements. Dr. Neal has two national best-selling books, and she will be signing books in our fellowship hall after this service. So if you want to read more of her story, keep those hands up, guys, till they come. If you want to read more of her story, just go out into the fellowship hall after this service. If you're alone at Thanksgiving, we have a couple more guys, a couple more newcomer bags up here, ushers. They're going to come. <laughs> if you're alone at Thanksgiving, please consider coming and joining your church family. My family, we all be here, and we're going to cook a great big bunch of turkeys. We ask people to bring side dishes if they come. We usually have about 100 or more people. There's a service of worship at 1030, followed by the big lunch meal. You're welcome to come to either or both, but please don't be alone at Thanksgiving time. You have a family with us here. Next Sunday is our St. Andrew's Evensong, which is an incredibly beautiful time, and we're so grateful for our choir, who you will hear in just a minute. And uh, the cathedral offices will close at noon on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving I don't know if some of you have heard, but we're going to be moving our bookstore out on the street with some of our offices in a beautiful old home, which will be called the Cathedral Annex and Bookstore. We're going to have a Christmas opening, so wait for the first Sunday of Advent. But we want to thank Scott and Lyle, who have helped us move and who have worked so hard. Are you here, you two? I don't know if they're here. Maybe There they are. And last but not least, uh, this, this speaker today is here to honor Bishop Frank Cervini, and it's part of our Cervini Speaker Series. Um, Bishop Frank is right over there, and as you know, was one of the great bishops and deans of this diocese and a fabulous preacher. So as part of our service today, we are going to endow the pulpit in his honor, and we're going to put this beautiful plaque on the pulpit where the verse from the Psalm 119, verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light in honor of Bishop Frank Cervini. So let us thank him for all that he's done for us. And we'll have that plaque out in Tolliver Hall for you to see it more closely before we put it on the pulpit for, the, for all of eternity. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. It is right to give him and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. W whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for you. You are the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ooh. Sorry, good morning. Good morning. By Jove, I think they're good. <laughs>